Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the To Hull and Back podcast, sponsored by the Old Zoological Bar and Pearson's Avenue and Kingfisher Fish and Chips on Spring Bank. Um, uh, another To Hull and Back special this time. We've got another Excel City player, and I'm, I'm very, very delighted to join, uh, to be joined by uh, ex Hull City player Stuart Elliott. Um, and I will lead up, read out some stats before he, we, we bring him in properly. 471 career appearances with 141 goals. Uh, 211 of those appearances as a Tiger and 68 of those goals. Do they sound correct to you, Stuart? Sounds about right. Scored that many, <laughs> I, I scored that many, I can't quite be sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I got these stats from, I, I tried to check various websites, so they're all say different, but I, I decided to go with uh, Tiger based on Cloud 7, uh, on Cloud 7, which is basically whole city related stuff. So I'll, 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 I'll give them a plug whilst we're at it. Um, so yeah, um, we'll, we'll, before we get into it, how are you doing anyway? What are you doing at the moment? Are you doing anything football related or are you just sort of? Um, I, I do a bit of work for the BBC here in Northern Ireland with the international games. Um, um, but as a lot of people knew and through my football career, I'm, I'm quite a dedicated Christian. So, mm. um, after I finished my football career, I'd always intended to go into Christian ministry. And um, I birthed a church now um, back in my local area where I grew up. And uh, it's thriving. It's doing well. So um, I'm greatly involved with that. That's my form of employment. And uh, also my wife, as I say, she's doing uh, interior design. Um, so she's got her own interior design studio. And then we've got a couple of um, sort of restaurants, stroke rotisseries open. Um, so we're very busy. Let's put it that way at the moment. Well, that's okay. Have you been keeping up? Do you keep up with Hull City uh, a lot? Do you, do you watch the results or anything? I do. I always have an eye on the, the, the Hull City games. And uh, I know they've been through a few uh, lean years there. But, um, mm. you know, the, the club seems to be in a better place at the minute. And uh, let's, let's hope they can go as far. Well, let's hope they get back into the Premiership again someday. Yeah, well, um, I was going to say, if there's anybody who knows about success as a Hull City player, you're one of them. Um, I, I believe you had... Three promotions as a as a whole city player. I think you you were still there in the two thousand seven eight season, wasn't you? You just yeah. Well, uh, I, 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 two promotions, um, and then I was there halfway through the year um, mm. for the third promotion, and left I think about six months before Phil Brown's boys got promoted back to the Premier League again. Um, I was wasn't too happy that, that I had to go at that time because um, mm. my wages would have went up probably ten times more in the <laughs> Premier League. <laughs> But nonetheless, yeah, I got a good, I got a good deal going to Doncaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say you went to Doncaster from it's not too far, I suppose, another Yorkshire side. Um, so we'll we'll, we'll chat about then. Obviously, um, the 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 because you you was with the club, you joined the club in, um, I believe in two thousand and two. Um, it was back when we was in the old Division Three back then, which is obviously League Two. Uh, you joined from Motherwell. Well, which I believe you had a, actually a really good successful stint at Motherwell. Uh, do you want to just talk about your time at Motherwell? And, and obviously, you, I believe you had to be sold because of, they, they fell into financial troubles, didn't they? Yeah, so um, I joined Motherwell and they did a lot of stars in their changing room. You guys like John Spencer, who played for Chelsea, um, Andy Gorham, who was a Rangers in Scotland legend, uh, Lee McCulloch, ex Rangers captain, Robert Martinez, um, who's he managing now? I think Portugal. Um, and mm. star started changing room that I came into, and I was really overwhelmed because a lot of these boys were my heroes, especially Andy Gorham, being a Ranger supporter growing up. Um, and when I arrived there, I didn't really expect that much of myself, but you know, I took to full time football very quickly, and I think I ended up their top scorer over both years. Um, but as you say, and um, great time in Scotland, um, but towards the end of the time. The, the club was going into administration. Of course, I was one of their assets. And I was told probably six months before I left that, that they were going to be selling me on. So um, it was a question of where am I going to go next? Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I, I came to the center of the universe, the city of Hull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, was was so so was um did you have many options then when you was about to leave Motherwell? Was was why why did you end up choosing Hull City? What what was it that lured you here? Well. I I will tell you it was a I've seen these earphones that drive me crazy and flipping ears as well. Um, I will tell you this. Um, the the um, it's an amazing way that I came to Hull. To be honest, um, I went to a church called the White Whale Church here in Belfast, and okay, and then they had a sister church in uh, Scotland. Okay, so I knew it was God's will for me to be there, and then I said actually four months before. Um, I came to Hull 
I said to my wife, it wouldn't surprise me if God was to take me to Hull in Yorkshire. And you say, well, why would you say that? Because we had the mother church in Belfast. We had a sister church in Falkirk next to Motherwell. And then there was another uh, sister church in one city in England, and it was in the city of Hull. And mm. of course, four, four months later, um, it was Hull City that put a bid, I think, of £220,000 into my signature. And I knew that it was the right thing as a Christian to go because it was, I just felt it was supernatural leading for me. And it turns out that when I got there, it was the right move to make. So that's ultimately, there was a lot of different clubs in for me. Um, clubs higher up the levels, um, I suppose, in England, right up into the championship. Um, but when I came down to Hull from Scotland, I knew it was the right thing from a Christian perspective, but also um, meeting Adam Pearson and seeing the vision that he had. I mean, the, the first couple of months I was in the Old Boothbury Park, but he took me to the what is now the KC Stadium. I was up in his porter cabin and uh, he showed me the vision. I couldn't believe this stadium <laughs> and I just wanted I just wanted to be part of this project. So Adam Pearson was a, was the he was the one who signed the deal basically for me. I, I, if he hadn't have been there, I don't know what would have happened. But when I seen the vision, when I seen the city, we seen how f- passionate the fans were, and it was a sleeping giant at the time. And so, therefore, I looked at the whole project and thought, yeah, I'll have some of this, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, like you say, I mean, your time at Motherwell, you got, I think, you got your first Northern Ireland cap while you was playing for Motherwell, uh, and you scored. <clears throat> I've got written down here twenty three goals in seventy games for them. So that's that's as a winger. Um, that's that's pretty yeah. good going, but um, yeah. And then that obviously, as 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 you got to City, your, your your goal record just improved year on year. It was it was crazy, really. Like I've got the stats down here now. I remember obviously the League One season will come to because that was just absolutely outstanding. Um, but obviously, like you say, when you, when you joined us in two thousand and two, um, I've got you go made thirty six appearances. You got twelve goals, and I believe you was top scorer that year. Um, at at the end of that season, I believe obviously Peter Taylor came in obviously uh, during that season, didn't he? And and, and I believe he you were more of a sub when you first came, but then he sort of integrated you into the side and gave you a bit of a different role. So I was, I was just interested to know what, so what kind of role did Peter Taylor have in sort of bringing out that, that extra bit of goal scoring ability that, that, that was in you? Well, me and me, Peter Taylor and I had a sort of a love hate relationship. <laughs> so we did okay. in a in a sense that um, when he came to the club, um, he wasn't quite sure about me because Peter Taylor always liked to have the two banks of four and uh, play the two centre forwards. Okay, very organised teams. Um, And I had this tendency to just want, as a midfielder, to keep getting into the box to score goals, Mm. (laughs) which is is not a bad habit to have. But Peter Taylor, I used to drive him crazy because I didn't do the more (laughs) defensive side of the game. So um, he said... He used to go like crazy at me at half time about trying to keep my shape and get back into shape. And I, I literally said to him one day on the Saturday, well, you can't have it both ways. You either want me to go and score goals or you want me to sit back in. But I'm not your normal left-sided midfielder. I need to get in the box. And so anyway, he went through me. But I'll tell you a funny story. Um, that one of the Saturday nights, um, he got home at about 10 o'clock. And this is how good a guy he was, really. Um, he phoned me. And he says, I told my wife that I went off on you today at halftime. And my wife has just told me I've got to ring you and apologize. <laughs> she, she, she said to him, he's a lovely young man. You can't be shouting at him like that all the time. And anyway, he does get a lot of goals. <laughs> so so um, the, the, the point is this. Peter Taylor knew that no matter how d- difficult the player I was regards to the defensive side, he always said, I'll never substitute you. He says, because you always come up and get us a winning goal in the last 15 or 20 mm-hmm. minutes. And that's, so I drove him crazy in the defensive sense, but he loved having me in the team with regards to scoring goals. Um, and yeah, so the, he, he was a great guy though. Um, I say love here, I use it, in the, use it in the lightest sense of the word. Um, but he was a great guy. And, you know, it was a marriage made in heaven, really, myself and Hull City during his years. Yeah, I mean, I think I think your what you described there is what we refer to nowadays as a you were a luxury player. So you were a player that <laughs> that, that sides it, will always have because they've got moments of magic in them to win the game, but they're not going to do much yeah. at the other end. But as a, as a fan and as a supporter, absolutely brilliant yeah. to watch. Uh, but like you say, yeah. So that first season, you started off as top scorer. Uh, we get into the second season, obviously two thousand three four, which is obviously the 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 first promotion we'd had from the bottom tier in nineteen years. Mm-hmm. We spent nineteen years in the bottom league. 
Um, yeah. What was different that season? What's a, what changed, obviously, from the season before into making us a side that sort of just, you know, romped to, to promotion in second place? Was was it literally just Peter Taylor's influence, the new signings and the new structure of the club? Or was it just sort of like that coincidence that the club just seemed to be on an upwards trajectory and you guys were the ones that took us there? Well, the first thing I would say, um, Ant, was the stadium was what was different. Mm. Um, we get into the stadium. We, I mean, sides come into that stadium were intimidated. They were, um, you know, because we had literally Premier League facilities. So you had the crowd behind you. Uh, Peter Taylor started to build bit by bit a team that was getting goals from all over the place. Um, you had the likes of Ashby who was sitting, Stuart Green in midfield. Um, you had Ben Burgess, Danny Alsop up front. I think we'd started to sign Nick Barnby as well. He was signed in in, two, in League One season, the next season. Yeah. So, but the season before, we, you know, we had goals coming from Ben. I think he got eighteen goals that year. Danny Alsop got fifteen. I got mm. what I think it was fourteen. Um, yeah. You had Jason, Jason Price. You had um, who else had you? You know, you had Andy Dawson, uh, Damien Delaney, um, Leon. <laughs> Yeah, all of these boys come through. Just a, there's a few of the old guard there as well in the first promotion season. Um, but Peter Taylor had built us into a team that was hard to break down. Everyone knew their job, but there was goals coming from all over the pitch. And so the first promotion winning season, I think that we were just that. That was it. We knew if I didn't score one particular day, then someone else was going to score, and that was the buildings of a big, a good team. But going into League One. Uh, um, it was a bit of a surprise at the start when we started out. We didn't know what to expect when we jumped up another league, um, but it, it just clicked. That from that season, I think we're talking now about the twenty nine goal season that I that, that I had. Yeah. That that season, I just felt I was right at the peak of my fitness levels. I felt I was confidence wise. I got off the ground and running. I think it was the first day of the season. And then I just never looked back. But I felt like a, I don't know, I felt strong as a lion <laughs> and I could leap like a gazelle. And I was, yeah. I was, I was just feeling wonderful. And every time I took to the pitch, it's hard to explain unless you're, you know, you've played professional football. Every time I took to the pitch that season, I believed that I was going to eat it up and I was going to score goals. And, but, you know, you get one, two, three, four, a, a quick start to the season like that, you start to build confidence. And uh, that just continued right throughout the year. Of course, until um, I think it was New Year's Day where I got my cheekbone busted. Mm. Um, I think it was Ethel Soji at Huddersfield. He, he elbowed me in the cheek. And uh, I've spent six weeks. That's another thing I think that people forget. I spent six weeks on the sidelines. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was, I've got, I've got that wrote down as a point to raise to you actually, because obviously you made in the in the two thousand four five season. I've got that you had thirty six appearances and you scored. I think it was just over thirty goals, which is insane at any level of football. And like you say, you missed six weeks. Um, and, and when you look back, and obviously we finished second to Luton that season. I think it was. Um, and and if you'd have played in those six weeks, because that you know in 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 league football that can be not just six games, it could be eight if you're playing, you know, Tuesday as well. Um, and mm -hmm. if you'd have been available for those games, we could have maybe won the title that season. So, but yeah, yeah it's such an impressive, and, and you actually shared the golden boot that year with Dino, um, obviously. I did. I, I Dino, Dino was a character, like, and Dino used to, I think when we, he was at Bradford, was he that year, I think? He yeah, he was been. at Bradford, yeah. But, but like, Dino, when we played at Bradford, he used to wipe me up. He says, no, you'll not be beating me this year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, but he was even when he was playing for Bradford, he was a whole lad through and through. He wanted to see us doing well, also. And uh, you know, uh, yeah, Dino did well. He's a legend, isn't he? At Hull City, really, mm. he did tremendously well that year. Yeah, he was very good that year. I mean, um, so like you say, this going into the season after the promotion from League Two, uh, and like you say, something just clicked. Something felt sort of um, better in yourself um, as a squad. Be as the season started, was promotion the aim? Was that what Peter Taylor was saying to you as a squad, or would you want him realistically to just consolidate, have a solid foundation, push the next year, or was it literally just, yeah, we're going to go for promotion again, we can do this? I think that he didn't put any pressure on us. Um, he had said that we'll see how we go this year. He believed we did have a, a, a squad that um, was was doing better. Well, we had a League Two squad. We just got promotion from League Two, but really we had a League One stroke lower part of the championship squad 
mm-hmm. um, when we went into the league one season. So Peter Taylor was quietly optimistic, but he he just said, "Listen, it might be a year of consolidation. We'll see how we go." But of yeah. course, the rest is history. Everybody, we really ripped it up that year, and we had a tremendous side. Um, you know, I think he ran France was coming in, Leon Court was coming in. Um, I'm trying to think, there's a few others as well. But Nick actually, Bambi he signed that year Nick, as well. Nick Barnby signed that year, and Nick was tremendous for everybody. His football intelligence was off the scale, but especially for my game, um, linking up with Nick Barnby was remarkable for me. Of course. I'm a Liverpool fan. He played for my favourite team and I know he played for Everton as well. But Nick was just a sort of player that I, for me as a, a winger trying to break beyond the forwards was just, it was a dream for me because he played these little intricate passes just in and off the, you know, coming off the defenders and just putting me in time and time again. And everything clicked. It, it, was, it was talent. It was goals coming from everywhere and also experience in the team. And, of course, you can't forget um, Ian Ashby, who just drove us on, <laughs> you know. Um, what was what was Ian Ashby like? Obviously, we, as a captain, and you see him, and obviously there was... Because uh, it's, it's weird when you look back, when Ashby was playing, yeah. he was actually divisive. He was a bit marmite with City fans, because a lot of City fans obviously said that, you know, every time we stepped up a level, he's not going to be good enough, he's not good enough, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, but he, he always raised his game and he even looked at home in the Premier League, obviously, at some point. And, but as a captain, what was he like? Because we've asked this to a couple of players we've played under and they all pre- basically said the same thing. So I'm interested to see what you say. But they were all saying, basically, he was a bit intimidating at first when he joins. But then he sort of mellows the more you get used to him. Or what, what, what well, I actually, I actually, I actually... Well, I would say the opposite. I would say he was very mellow when he joined and he got more intimidating right. as we went up the leagues. But uh, again, that's in the lightest sense. Uh, Ian was tremendous. Um, uh, I think that, you know, people talk about my goals and stuff that particular season, but Ian was the driving force behind the team. He just would not let our standards drop whatsoever. And if, if you weren't at it on a Saturday, come half time, you would you would hear about it, you know. Ian would start an argument on purpose at half time on a Saturday if we were mm. our standards had dropped, and he would take hold of somebody just to get us riled up again for the second half. Um, so it was sort of a Roy Keane sort of figure, and he just liked to stir it up so that everybody was kept on their toes. But a tremendous professional, very very fit guy as well. Um, he was very dedicated to the game, but just was a, a fantastic captain and he was really a catalyst for our success during those years can't speak highly enough about him although i had a few arguments with him i think everybody everyone did and we, we yeah, all we all argued imagine. um but we get on well you know so we did so yeah all right so we'll come back to nick bambi then because i think that at the time that was kind of a a groundbreaking signing because obviously he he was a premier league player um i, I believe he was at, he came to us from leeds didn't he um and, yeah. and dropping down to league one just surprised everybody but obviously he wanted to come to his hometown club and and, and believed in the project as as did you at the time um but as players in a changing room what's it like when because obviously I, I assume you find out before or you know he's in and around the training ground and 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 that kind of thing, and he could be signing. What's it like in the dressing room with all the players when when somebody that high profile is coming and potentially being your teammate? Well, um, the good thing about Nick was that you wouldn't have known um, that Nick had played numerous times for his country, massive games, and for the likes of Liverpool, who else did he play for? Everton, he played for Everton, he played for Leeds, because Nick came in and he was the most humble guy you could meet. Um, he wasn't one of these ones that run about the change room going, you know, I'm Nick Barnby, and so everybody listened to me. No, it was just a local hull lad, and he was very humble from the outset. Um, loved getting alongside the younger players, um, speaking to them. He certainly helped me a lot. I, there was nights probably when people wouldn't know this, but I'm just giving you a little insights. We, pre-season, we were away in London, and Nick would have knocked on my bedroom door and we'd have come in and would have sat down and would have had a chat with me and said, it's great what you're doing. You could improve on this. You could think about that. And just would have called into people's rooms just to try and help them out. And that was valuable for me um, to have someone like him, you know, just imputing his wisdom uh, toward into my career. So I always seen him as a true gentleman. He never went about his business in a loud sort of manner. 
if, if Nick had to speak, then you heard about it um, because there was something important to say. But he did things in a quiet way and he led by example when he was on the pitch. Um, so I can't speak highly enough of him. And I think, again, that's another signing that really turned everything around at Hull City. Um, you talk about myself, had a massive impact, like of Andy Dawson. Different, there's a lot of guys really did, but you look at the likes of Ashby and the likes of um, Nick Barnby as well. And of course, Windass came um, later on. So tremendous guy, tremendous player, and can't speak highly enough about him. Yeah, um, I, I mean, it was like I say, it was a, that was kind of it was phenomenal signing for the for the level that we were at as well. It was it was absolutely brilliant. Um, I've got I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of the, um, the 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 listener questions just because it sort of relates to this season, and um, I've got uh, so Tom Collins has asked on Twitter. He said, "What was the key to that 2004 five season?" Which I feel like we've already covered slightly, um, uh, and and then this leads into the next part that we was obviously going to talk about. You've the first season in the championship. What was the biggest challenge as a squad and for yourself stepping up as a championship team? Because obviously you would, you, we were on side two years ago. Just and you've done back to back promotion, and now you're in the championship. Uh, Sorry, I made the signal, just went a little bit there. Oh, did it? It was, uh, yeah, basically just asking about it. Tom Collins asked um, what the step up was like from that 2005 season, uh, promotion season in League One to the Championship. Was it was it difficult or was it, you know, something that you expected? Yeah, it was, it was difficult. Um, you know, I think the reality is the Premier League was starting to really boom at that particular time. And so they were getting the best players from all over Europe. Um, and basically... The best players from Great Britain, in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, were coming then into the championship. So the standards were just rising and rising and rising. And when I when I uh, was there, of course, it was a step up. Um, it was a lot a lot bigger step up than the than the League One was. But at that time, I don't think people had really um, grasped that I had behind the scenes been diagnosed with exercise induced asthma. Um, so um, it's called bronchial hyperreactivity, and I was having a lot of health problems that particular year. And I think the supporters were asking, I think I scored still eight or, eight or nine goals, but the supporters were asking, why is the standard sort of dropped that particular year? Mm. And uh, yeah, it was a harder league, but I was also having health problems as well, and I couldn't tell people um, as to what was going to happen. And of course, Adam Pearson, um, the manager, helped me out that particular year, but it was a, it was a tough league to go into. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask obviously about the um, the diagnosis and um, which was did do you feel like then because obviously I I believe it's like a narrowing of the airways and leaves you with shortness of breath and things like that, but um, it left it obviously difficult for you to play a full ninety minutes and do, do you feel like that diagnosis then sort of you know kind of hindered your career because obviously you've just off the back of an absolutely amazing season where you've got you know joint golden boot. You're playing for your country, and uh, you know, and it's it's you're at a stage now where you're at the second tier of English football, and then you sort of obviously yeah. you get this really really bad news. And did you know sort of in your head that maybe this was now where your career was going to start declining? Um, or, or, or yeah, yeah, was, was there was there advice that you could probably I, continue? Yeah, we tried it. We tried and. Um, when I was away with Northern Ireland, we tried, I went to see a guy called Professor Maurice and he was in Cottingham. Okay. He was sort of a specialist, one of the best specialists in the world that the club didn't spare any expense to get this sorted out. But he diagnosed that he gave me different um, medications for it. And I was taking those when I was on international duty. And then of course with Hull City as well, to try and help open the airways a little bit. And uh, they were good to start with. I felt back to my old self again. And then of course the medication, once I get into the system, it just didn't operate the way it should have. And I knew then that, that my career was on the downward spiral. Um, and um, I think one of the one of the days for me was a really low time. I played against um, West Bromwich Albion away with Hull City, okay? And um, I was brought off at half time because it was just, it just wasn't up to scratch. And uh, what was happening really was um, because the airways weren't opening, the blood wasn't getting around my system and it was starting to cramp up. So it was a terrible feeling. I was taken off. I remember traveling home. I get into the the um, 
the driveway of my home, my wife came out to meet me and I didn't even get out of the car. I just sobbed like a child. I just sobbed like a baby. I was so down. And um, again, I couldn't tell the supporters that that was what was happening to me that particular year. So it was very difficult and my standards were never really the same again because of it. Um, the older you get, it was having more of an effect on me as my career went on. Does that make sense? It does. <laughs> I'm just switching off the laptop to the phone so I've got better signal. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah. Weird it worked. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, um, it, 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 it obviously was a point where you really could have pushed on and done something sort of amazing with this team. And um, like I said, off the back of that season where you scored, what, 20, 30 odd goals. And then obviously this season in the Championship, you went for, uh, to, to seven. Um, and obviously the, the 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 stats were a lot less. I believe you only had twenty six stats out of the forty appearances that season. So, um, like you yeah. say, it's, it's, it must have been absolutely heartbreaking news. And I, and I feel like that. Um, obviously, your career as a City player going into that. I mean, obviously, the team a couple of years after ended up getting promoted to the Premier League. Um, do you feel like if you hadn't have had that diagnosis, that you could have continued to push on as you were and? and be a bigger part of that, obviously, that whole City legacy and playing in that 2007-8 season? Without a doubt, and without a doubt, and again, I'm not making excuses. I just know it for a fact. My my body just wasn't what it was a few years earlier. It's as simple as that. Now I know there's natural sort of things for that. The older you get, you know, the harder it gets. We're going up the levels as well. I take all that into consideration. But I genuinely wasn't functioning the way I knew I could function. And had I not have got that diagnosis, um, then I believe I believe I could have went to the Premier League with Hull City, no problem. I'm not saying I would have burned the Premier League up, no way. Um, but I, I certainly could have been part of Phil Brown's plans. And uh, I just think that that's such a shame, really, because it would have been my dream to be at Wembley that particular day mm. with Hull City. You know, I think that would have been great for me. And I think the supporters would have liked to have seen that as well, to be honest with you. Um, but... Um, yeah, it was actually quite sad because when Hull City got the promotion that day, I was actually in London waiting to go and play for Doncaster the next day at Wembley. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Here, here I am. Um, you know, Hull City was my club. Um, I, you know, fans' favourite, and I'm sitting in a hotel room watching Hull City get promoted to the Premier League, waiting to go and play there the day after with Doncaster. It just some, somehow didn't, didn't seem quite right, you know. Yeah, I mean, you see, because as as a fan, and maybe rather selfishly, obviously, it was when you when you think back to sort of like you know the players that carry such a legacy with this club and and the players that played with us in in all four divisions, and 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 that you weren't one of those players that got to represent us in the Premier League. It's really, really, a sort of it's 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 kind of it's obviously sad um, because I I believe obviously the the way your career was sort of, you know, like League Two, League One Championship and you were scoring more and more every season. And like we say, you were playing for your international, uh, you were representing Northern Ireland and it, it, yeah. it was such a, a, a massive point of your career and it must have been so heartbreaking. But obviously, I mean, from that point, like we say, I mean, the, the appearances just sort of, um, obviously, like you, you joined, I believe, you went to Grimsby as well. You, you I think you yeah. probably only made a 40-odd appearances from, you know, the next few years and, and your career sort yeah. of obviously wound down a bit but back to more positive stuff obviously because it was such a fantastic career before that and the amount of goals that you scored I mean you still made like we say over 400 nearly 500 appearances in your career so it was it was absolutely brilliant but uh, we'll get on to some favourites then because I, I, I want to know and I feel like we had a question about asking about it before JP Fuster yeah what was your favourite goal as a Hull City player? Okay um, f feeling wise Feeling wise, well, what take favorite as 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 your best okay. goal or whichever one feeling. So one of the one I one of the one of the ones I got most pleasure out of, I think it was it was either Boxing Day or the twenty eighth of December. We played Doncaster. Remember, it was a real top of the table clash. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that one where I think it might have been one one, and I went through in the last five minutes or something on the keeper, um, yeah. one on one with the keeper. And just slid it in to, to win that top of the table clash. Um, yeah. the, 
But do you know what I you know what I can remember from that aunt? I can remember twenty five thousand seats as I went through one on one with the keeper. Do you know the sound as the seats just go up as the people yeah, get yeah. off their feet? That's all I can remember. Everyone was on their feet. Anticipation. And I think John Walters or someone like that was the side of me looking me to square the ball, but I slid it past the keeper. I mean, feeling wise, that was just absolutely fantastic. But I think one of my best goals um, was probably the second one against Brentford. If you remember, it was nearly the yeah. halfway line when I shrugged yeah. the guy off the ball. And like every, I could hear Peter Taylor saying to me, you know, pass the ball, pass the ball. <laughs> and, and I just decided to do one of those crazy things that I did and went for goal. And yeah. um, yeah, the, key, the next thing I see is the keepers land in the back of the net and the ball's in the back of the net. So um, there are two that I would pick out. And uh, yeah. of course, my, my country, um, it was probably, uh, it was Azerbaijan the Saturday before we played England and beat England 1-0 at Windsor Park. I scored a free kick from a country. It was a lovely Saturday afternoon. My family was all there. Um, and that's a, another goal that really is close to my heart. Yeah, I remember watching that goal, to be fair. Um, a couple of questions, and obviously, before I get on to some other ones, we've got uh, Jimmy Chu. Um, I believe you yeah. know Jimmy. He said, hi, Stuart. Hope yourself, Laura, and the kids are all keeping well. Um, have you have your kids taken to football yet? And are we going to see any mini Elliots in black and amber? <laughs> Unfortunately not. Nathan, my son, he is a brain box. So um, Nathan, uh, he's in the investment banking now, um, and he does a lot of crypto market and things like that. So he's... Really, he's making more money than I, than I did in my football <laughs> career. So, um, yeah, that's what he's doing. Um, my daughter, um, she's studying at the moment. Um, she's also working as a manager in one of our shops at this particular time while she does her studies. And, uh, yeah, so I can't see um, any Elliot, either, you know, male or female football coming through anytime soon. <laughs> it's a shame we've got we've got quite a few legacy players at the minute. Like we've got Jacob Greaves in from Matt Greaves as well. Um, yeah. And Nathan. Nathan is a good player, mind you. He's a very good player. But um yeah, but the family's all keeping well. Everybody's in good health and um and yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh we've got a couple on uh someone asking, was you in the same team as Jason Price at Doncaster? Uh yes, I was. Um I think for about six months anyway. Price he was a great guy. He's a good laugh, you know, always he he was He's just a most most laid back player I've ever met in my life, <laughs> you know. Um, but a great goal scorer, and at Hull we had great times, and again at Doncaster we had great times. So we we're very close friends. Yeah, I spent some time at Doncaster with him. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite um, oh God, favorite Hull City game? So I'll, I'll actually now I'll open it to your entire career. What was a favorite game you've ever played in? If you could replay it again, like for the first time, which one would it be? I think. Um, ooh, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Um, I think probably the both. I would, I would probably two. The, the the when we received our first promotion, who was it we were playing away that day? I'm trying to remember. That was oh. against. It was a way to Yeovil. It was a way. Yeah, to yeah, it was. Yeah, two one. That that was one of the best days in my football career to to see the promotion with Hull City. I could see that. Um, back at the stadium, there was big screens set up and yeah. you know celebrating with the fans. And then I think the, the second promotion winning season, we played Bristol or something like that at the KC, and it was just a real celebration. Those those days you'll never forget. I think they're they're, they're two days that it that really stands out um, to me. And then of course the open top bus tours around the city, um, mm. celebrating with the fans and at the you know, the city hall in the yeah. balcony overlooking. You know, um, all the supporters out, and there must have been six, seven, eight thousand people out that day. Was, there are times that I'll never forget, but those two games in particular are ones that are very close to me. And of course, I'll never forget like the Brentford game where I scored two cracking goals, you know. But I could pick so many, and to be honest, yeah, with you. You, you, you did so many goals to see. I mean, I, I mean, I think the one that I remember quite fondly was the um, because obviously in the championship, like we would, we've just discussed it, it, it wasn't the best season for you personally and on the pitch but um that that time you came off the pit uh, off the bench to score two against qpr i feel like a lot yeah. of City fans have that in high regard that that was the especially the header i mean I, I, to be fair um i've got a header related question for you and i don't know if this is actually answerable <laughs> or it's just it, i mean it's um uh, who asked it let's have a look um it was john o'brien he says how did you manage to hang in the air so long because you you were absolutely brilliant in the air with headers is that yeah. something you have to teach yourself or is it just pure athleticism? 
It's it's just something that I believe God puts in you. It's just a God given talent for me. To be honest with you, um, I I was like five eleven. Well, still always be five eleven. But <laughs> you was. But, but <laughs> I was five eleven. I'm a bit bigger now. <laughs> no, but no matter what, it seemed to be a timing thing for me. I had this knack of like players that probably six one six two going up against them, and it, it wasn't so much about height then for me. It was a, I had a massive spring. Um, and then it was about, I just knew when the ball was coming to make sure that I was up at the right time. So usually you would find as they were coming down, I was still rising. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I always had this knack of getting to the ball just to, you know, just at the right time. So it was a timing thing, athleticism, you could say. But uh, I can't tell, really tell you how other than to say it was, a, it was a gift that was there. And I utilized it as much as possible, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, when I read it, I thought, I don't know if you can actually answer that question, because I feel like it's just natural. Sometimes as a footballer, you just, you're good at things, and, and that's that's can what I, gets you into I, that. Can I tell you something, um, right, um, and see this season, um, bef- bef- that's that particular season, the 29 gold season. Mm. Um, when I was, as a Christian, when I was praying about, you know, asking God's blessing on that season, um, I got a promise from the Bible and um, from the book of Habakkuk. And here's the promise. I will make your feet like hinds feet. I will make you to walk upon the high places. And sort of the, if you see those, like the hinds, they would be on the cliffs and they can jump and they can leap. So I believe yeah. it was a God, God-given sort of ability that was given to me. And that, that year, it certainly came to the fore. That well, we're certainly thankful for it. <laughs> Wherever the gift came from, we'll take it. We'll I, take I it. used to, I used to laugh and that the song the supporters used to sing, um, "Here's to you, Stuart Elliot. Jesus loves you more than you want." Yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, all, we all knew you loved that one, I believe. Um, it's also related to sort of obviously that season. Um, Matt from Tiger Base, obviously, who had all the stats I've got for you on on on, on this episode. He said, um, what was it actually like being part of that promotion side? Obviously, both in the League Two, because we'd been in, in that division for 19 years. Um, and sort of, did, did you realise as, as, as a player and, and as, a, as a club, how crucial that was as, as sort of part of Hull City's history? Yeah, um, we knew what it meant to the, to the supporters. Um, we knew, as I said to you, that um, <clears throat> Hull City was a sleeping giant. Um, I remember Adam Pearson saying to me at the time, when I first joined the club, he he had this vision to take the club up through the leagues. He wanted them to be right up in the Premier League, and uh, he was going to put the finances behind it. Of course, the infrastructure was in place. Like he said to me, you know, we're getting probably eight to twelve thousand people at, at Boothbury Park, which is tremendous. He says, but I know that this new stadium will bring in and it will be filled the capacity, and that's exactly what happened. Um, so momentum was building. The people were really expecting. There was a lot of pressure on us to deliver. We knew how much it meant. And so to actually get those back-to-back promotions was absolutely tremendous. And, of course, I think everybody now looking back on that, and anytime I speak to anyone from Hull, say it was a real golden period in the, in the club's history. And I always look back with fondness now, knowing that I was part of something. To be, be part of that team under Peter Taylor was just – there was so much camaraderie. It was amazing. Like some of the things that went on in the change room were quite laughable. I'll never go into the stories, but um, just the team atmosphere, the way we pull together. You know, um, I, I, lis- I listened about the great teams in the Premier League, you know, Manchester United's and, and, and Liverpool teams. And, and what you usually find is they will say the manager didn't need to say that much because the players pulled the team through. And that's what I could say. The, our manager, after he'd done all of the, the tactics through the week, he didn't need to say that much because on a Saturday when we looked around that changing room and seeing the talent we had in the changing room, we knew that we had it to beat teams and that we went out with complete confidence that even if we were behind, we were going to turn it around. Mm. I mean, like you say, when, when you look back, obviously, especially to where we ended up going and um, obviously teams after you had, 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 had taken us to the Premier League again and then obviously we've had an FA Cup final, a brief stint in Europe and We've not. We've only dropped below the championship once, I think, since two thousand eight. So, it's 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 what you and that that set of players did, and obviously Peter Taylor and Adam Pearson at that time. It literally was the foundation for what has gone on to be the most successful period of this club's history. So, I mean, yeah. obviously, like you say, you, the the diagnosis and everything like that sort of hindered 
where you could have gone with us, which is really frustrating. But you, like you say, you still were such a huge part of 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 of, of that initial promotion, that initial springboard to take us to, you know, heights that some of us never thought we'd see. I mean, I I always got stick from because um, I used to go with my uncles, but they 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 used to watch all the the struggling times through the through the eighties and nineties and that and and when I started coming, I saw obviously like the great escape onwards. So all I've seen was us avoid relegation and then get promotion, promotion, promotion. And they were, <laughs> they were quite envious because we're like, it's, it's not like this sport in City. Um, but no, like obviously, I mean, me on behalf of all City fans, we, we, we just want to thank obviously what you did for, for the club and, and, and what you contributed to, to, to this city as a whole as well. I mean, it just, you know, it was amazing for the surrounding area and everything like that. So it was absolutely Do you know what? Do you know what the, the the people of the people just loved me and my family? I'll never forget them. Um, they welcomed us. You know, I don't think I ever had a negative word from one of the supporters. I, there was always positives. They were just a lovely, lovely people. And uh, yeah, listen, guys went on and done even greater things than we done in the Premier League. We know that, but I was just glad to be a small part of of what happened and, and at that particular time. And uh, I'm glad to see the club doing well. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, those Premier League days wouldn't have happened without what you guys did. So you can, yeah, you can I was, look back at that. I was delighted to see it, mate, to be honest with you. I never have regrets in life, and I, I think everything happens for a reason. So I never have regrets. And uh, I'm glad to be there when I was there. And to see the boys doing well after that was tremendous for me. Yeah, I and mean, then um, I've got a couple of, I think I've got Wally Daft here. So does Stuart recall the chip from outside the box at Plymouth uh, with City down to 10 men? Mark Jersey yeah. got sent off, but we still won one nil. Yeah, yeah, I do. I was, a, I, you know what? You see, these the guys are just bringing back all of these memories for <laughs> the different goals. The reality of the matter is, I was having a stinker that day. <laughs> I was having a terror. <laughs> uh, the pitch was sticky. I liked the very lush pitch, so the ball could get out to you quickly and get by people. But I was having a terrible game, and um, and then do you know, do you know what? My, my energy was zapped because I think it was quite a. Uh, summer's day i think it might have been but it was warm out there anyway and i decided instead of running with it 40 yards why not just try and chip the keeper from, four, from, <laughs> from 35 whatever it was and it was a great chip i just pinged it and it just the keeper wasn't expecting it right over his head i'll never forget that i think we had the black kit on that day i loved that kit the, the black yeah. amber kit um so yeah tell him thanks for um for bringing that one up that was a good one uh, he's watching live so he'll, he'll have heard that anyway um, yeah, so did you have, obviously, in, I'm, I'm not going limit it, to limit it to just Hull City, obviously, but did you have a favourite manager that you played for? And, and, and like, what was the reasoning behind, obviously, preferring to play for that person? Yeah, um, I think uh, my favourite manager was um, Peter Taylor, um, because they're, they're the best years for me, but also... Um, he was a guy who was just a brilliant manager, but he was a brilliant uh, person as well. And, you know, whether it was good times or bad times, I, got, I knew his door was always open and he was always willing to help. He was just, he was the perfect manager for all city, the perfect fit at that particular time. So he would probably be one of my favorites. Um, I would also say at international level, Laurie Sanchez um, was, was very good with me. Um, I remember when he came in, the joke was that um, when Saddam Hussein came up out of his bunker, do you remember during the Gulf War when the British yeah. troops had caught him, the, the first question he asked, has Northern Ireland scored a goal yet? <laughs> 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 because we were going through a barren period under Sammy McElroy. And then uh, Laurie Sanchez came in and he made me a big part of that successful time in Northern Ireland's history where we beat Spain. We were beating England. Um, sorry for bringing that up for all you guys. <laughs> um, but but he was tremendous, and he got the belief back into the team. Um, it was a real family feel when he was there um, with regards to Northern Ireland at the time. So he's one of my favourite managers to work under as well. So Peter Taylor and um, Laurie Sanchez. Very interesting. I mean, um, like we say, I mean, your 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 career, especially in terms of what you contributed to all city can you remember actually i'll give you a bit of trivia i, I can imagine you remember because all players will remember these can you remember which game you would it was your solo whole city hat trick mm. right that's a good question actually Jeez, I'm you know, I, have to, know it. I have to in my mind go back through all these different goals <laughs> Just, <laughs> there's so many <laughs> any clue any clues on that my mind's went blank on this 
Uh, they wear brand. white. They wear white. Mm. No. And it was in, it was obviously it's... in your, your 29 goal season as well. So it was in League One. This is, this is going to kill me now, so it is, if I forget this. It was no. the... It was a 6-1 win over Tranmere. Ah, Tranmere Rovers, of course. See, I told you, <laughs> that's going to drive me crazy now because um, I remember um, the keeper in the first half of that game. He got, I think I smacked him in the head, but was yeah. going for the ball and ended up getting him instead. But yeah, I remember the last goal, the penalty. <laughs> yeah, it was Theo Whitmore went in goal, obviously, he was the next season. He was, player, a, he? he was in goal. He didn't even try, did he? he just <laughs> And uh, yeah, how can I forget that? Honestly, but uh, there were so many good days. Yeah, that was. I think it was a really wet day that day. Mm. You know, the rain was pelting down, but the pitch was just perfect. So we were all up for it. And uh, yeah, to beat Tranmere six that day was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the other goals that have scored. Actually, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've got, I've got for, for for goal scoring. So obviously, I've I've got here. So in your, in your two thousand two three season, you got twelve goals. Your two thousand three four, you got fourteen. Your 2004-05, you got 30 all competitions, obviously. Um, your your 5 6 season, you got seven goals. And then, obviously, 6-7-5, yeah. and then none in the last season. But, like, like we say, the, the, the season was curtailing yeah. at that point. But um, it was, you know, like you said, 68 goals in, in 211 uh, appearances. Two player of the seasons as well, obviously, in your, your 2002-03 season and the 2004-05. I mean, that just goes without saying that one. Um, yeah. And 39 caps for your country. Surely you look back at your career and just think, do you know what? I did it. Yeah, I do, mate. And um, I, I always give God the glory for those things that I knew I couldn't have done it on my own strength. Um, I had talent, but, you know, I was blessed as well. And just to, just to look back now, I've come in thoroughly satisfied. I don't know many wingers and that have those sorts of stats, you know. Um, I don't know many that would have those sorts of stats. Uh, I, I can't think, you know. But, no, I mean, obviously, as as football modernised in the last few years, we've had players like obviously Jared Bowen most recently, and and yeah. who, who who was a who was a good goal scorer from the right wing. But football changed from obviously traditional wingers, left footer playing on the left side, etc. We we kind of go with a lot of sides use inverted wingers or inside forwards, whatever you want to call them now. Yeah. Don't they? Where obviously the left footer plays on the right and cuts in. Um, as opposed to trying to cross it in for a striker, but yeah, it was at the time you were playing at the time, yeah, to, to score that amount of goals as a winger was just it was unheard of, yeah. And, and that's why I look back with fondness now, I've got no regrets. I I know that every time I took to the pitch, what I had literally within me, I left on the pitch and I give all that I had for the club. Um, I've seen players down through the years, you know, come to big clubs, take the wages, and away they go, you know, but. Uh, for integrity's sake, I wanted to do everything I could for the club. I, I, I'll have to give a special mention also to Adam Pearson. Adam Pearson was just an amazing man. I have so much respect for that man and what he did for Hull City and what he did for me and for my family as well. Um, do you know? Do you know why? Do you know one of the things that buttered me up? He brought me down in a private jet. <laughs> he, he he sent he sent a plane for me to come to Hull. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> he must have like, really wanted you. <laughs> uh, I think he did. I think he was going to see the deal. But like the guy done, didn't do anything by halves, whether it was hotels or whatever. He wanted the best for Hull City. And I could, it would be wrong of me today not to mention his name because I just I think he's an amazing guy. Yeah. Yeah, he did. at the time, I mean, he was perfect for the club and how he improved yeah. the club both off and on the pitch. It was, you know, he was an outstanding person, really, when you look back at it. And, yeah. Um, like like we say, he brought he brought you to the club. He brought so many of the legends that we well, the players that we now call legends. And yeah. um, I mean, it's, especially with the amount of players you look back at, that like we say, we signed in the bottom division and made it all the way to the top, and still looked at yeah. home in the Premier League. I mean, Andy Dawson, Ryan yeah. France, Ian Ashby, uh, Stuart Green. There's another crack Stuart Green. player. I, he, I mean, I love playing with Greeny. He was amazing. So he was what a what a luxury player he was. But um, you're right, another mention for Andy Dawson, what a servant to the club Andy was. Um, I was good friends with Andy, he was, he was an absolute gentleman, you know. And of course, me and him played down the left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says, he says, I'm, I'm sick of covering your ass, he used to say. <laughs> I was going to say, didn't he that. give you any stick for not giving him any support? He, he just, he, he wasn't the sort of guy who would have confrontation with anyone. He just, he was so good a player, he just done his job. And you know what, he did the de defensive side for me. 
Um, and so I could go forward, but he takes a lot of plaudits for, for what happened at Hull City during those years as well. Yeah, a lot of praise for Greeny. Yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was a, he was a bit of a mercurial talent. Greeny, he was a, he was a very stylish midfielder. Once he was, um, you know, you nowadays number ten kind of player. Once he, yeah, he, um, he got me. Oh, go he got me. He got me wearing cream boots, cream predator <laughs> boots, and I knew I got I worn them for about two games and had to take them off again. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. There's, there's a lot of players that weren't weren't a fan of obviously the club. I mean, it's very normal now, but back then, obviously, it wasn't. Um, obviously, mentioning your goal scoring record, was you ever tempted to play as a striker to ask to play through the middle? Was that? Would you ever ask to? Well, I was. Um, I think if you if you look more in detail into those games, especially the first two seasons, you'll find that there's, there's a lot of times that Peter Taylor shifted me from the left wing to a centre forward position. Um, because he knew how good I was in the air. Um, so like the likes of Jamie Forrester um, when they were in the team or Danny Alsop, who were players that liked to get in and behind. Um, sometimes if Ben Burgess had got injured, Peter Taylor would have said to me, you go to the centre forward role because I know how good you are in the air with flicking balls on. Um, and he knew how good I was in the box at finishing. So there's a, there's a lot of times when I actually played through the centre and um, more than probably people would even realise. Mm. Yeah, um... You know, it's the Tigers newsroom saying hello as well. They've just popped. They made the graphic actually that I put up at the beginning. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those where um, do, do you ever look back and think maybe I maybe I was a striker and I just played on the left and and just classed myself as a winger? No, I'll tell you why. Always a winger. I did, I always a winger. And do you know why? And I didn't like playing with my back to the game. I didn't like mm. it. I just like the I late runs not... into the box. I loved hanging off the, the back of the fullback. And like you look at my goals and how many times does a fullback think, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Oh, he's on the wing, he's on the wing, and all of a sudden, bang, I can yeah. buy them at the back post and it's in the back of the net. That was my game. I loved it. I loved having those that ten yards of space with your, your feet on the white line, waiting for the ball to come out to you so you can get at people or coming in at the back post at the last minute. That's what I was really good at, and facing the goal rather than um, facing away from it. That makes sense. And I, and I suppose the last question then before we wrap it up, unless anybody watching has got any more questions to ask before he goes, um, would you ever tempt to go into coaching or managing anything like that? You know, to sort of keep staying football, but in a, in a different role. Um, not really, because I knew even as a uh, a footballer that I was going to go into Christian ministry, and that's mm. where my heart my heart would lay, and um, so that's where I put all my focus and energies into. But um, my son often comes to me and says, "Dad, you could have been managing that Northern Ireland team," <laughs> um, because I think I was a good communicator. I think I had a good way with people, and I think I would have been a good coach. Um, but I just I had a desire to do what I wanted to do after yeah. my career. And that's what I focus my time on. But I still love football. Liverpool is actually my team. Um, <laughs> they're, they're my favourite team. And I, 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 while I was playing, and I sort of way lost the love as a fan, if you know what I mean, because you're in the midst of playing every day, yeah. right? But but you see, like a, a year after finishing, I sort of detoxed for a year from football, and then see after that, I got my mojo back as a fan, um, yeah. supporting Liverpool. So there's times when. Whether I love looking for whole cities um, scores and see see them doing well, but on a on a Sunday or a Saturday, my wife will hear me screaming in the living room. Um, <laughs> I've Liverpool, Liverpool's playing just back to fan mode again, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Who who if 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 sit if obviously if we were playing Liverpool in the cup, who who, who are you vying for? No, that's not a good question to ask. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll let you. I'll 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 want City to win that one. Just a one off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you have that just because you're on this podcast. Yeah. Um, so I've got one here from Paul. So I think I feel like this is obviously in relation to because this season Liam Rosini plays obviously a, a play out from the back, possession based style of play. Whereas obviously when you played for Peter Taylor, I imagine it was more obviously a direct get the ball forwards as quick as possible. What kind of style would you have preferred to play under? I mean, I, I feel like I know this answer judging on your goal record, but. Um, do you feel like you'd have, have, have suited the, the possession-based system that, that we play at the minute? No, I think I think it's a, to be honest with you, here's the honest answer. I think the, the possession-based is a better system now. I think everybody's adapting it, but it wouldn't have suited my game. My game was ball into the centre forward, runs off the centre forward, 
and you know the four four two system and getting into the box and scoring goals. So I was, I was a, I was used to. Sorry, I adapted well to my time, but I don't know how well I would adapt to the possession game nowadays. How I mean, I'm going to follow on from that. How much power yeah. do, do the players have in obviously determining? Because if a manager comes in, they're going to want to play their system, their style of football. And, and you as players obviously have to learn that and, and incorporate into your game. But say, for example, you played under, uh, let's play devil's advocate, you played under Peter, Kale, uh, Peter Taylor for, for, for however many years. And a new manager comes in and says, we're going to play a possession-based style, one forward. Um, you know, we're we're going to take care of the ball. Um, would you be able to say to him, I don't think that's going to work with this squad of players or do you literally just have to get on with it and and, and, and try and learn it? Well, I think... I think any good manager will listen to his players. Um, I just heard a report there, Wayne Rooney, when he joined Birmingham, he was actually losing the first couple of games or whatever else, and he asked the players, is what I'm asking you to implement? Is it too, is it too difficult? He's not used to it. Like any good manager will speak to their players when they come into a club. And I think the good thing for Peter Taylor is that he always spoke to us and communicated with us and asked us what we were comfortable with. He had a system, but he also spoke to his players. So it's not an either or, it was a both hand. And mm -hmm. like, remember I used, I was saying earlier on in the conversation that it, he used to I used to drive him crazy with regards to the, the defensive side of the game. Well, mm -hmm. he adapted the whole team to suit me then. What he yeah. did was he, he, he basically told the, the forward, Ben Burgess or Danny Alsop, if he goes beyond you, you've got to drop into the left-hand side of midfield. So he had that he adapted our whole system to suit my game and listened and, and brought the strengths of my game out. And you know, we all helped each other in that way, you know. So any good manager will will listen to the players, but will keep to his philosophy as well. Yeah, makes sense. Uh Wally Daft's asked, what was your favorite ground to play at? Hmm. I imagine you played it a lot. I'm trying to think. Um wow. <laughs> it's a good question. And, uh, Leicester City was a good was a good ground. I, I enjoyed playing there. Um, they they always had the what's it's like these, these things that they bang against their hand. I don't know the what clappers. it is. But it was, yes. I, the clappers. The atmosphere was absolutely amazing there. So it was, you know. So Leicester City was a good ground to play at. And then a lot of the little small grounds were were you know the away days were, were good going to some of the smaller grounds around England the real atmosphere you could smell the hamburgers coming out of the burger <laughs> stalls you know <laughs> but yeah Leicester's one that stands out to me falls added on um Luton what's it like to play at Kenilworth Road because obviously that's got a lot of a lot of media attention oh. since they've become a Premier League team and obviously the stadium's very old-fashioned and walking over the tops of it for the away fans over somebody's garden and things like that as a stadium yeah. what's it like to play there as a player it wasn't great, I'll be honest with you. Do you see? <laughs> do you see? See midweek, one of the midweek games we had at that stadium, and the rain was pelting it down. The supporters were on top of you. The pitch in those days was shocking. And um, you know, Tuesday night away at Luton or Wednesday night away at Luton is like you know Groundhog Day. So like even when Liverpool played them a few weeks ago, I thought this is not going to be an easy game because the little tight pitch, the atmosphere. I think I think Luton will end up staying in the Premier League this year because of playing at Kenilworth Road. I think a lot of sides are going to find it difficult, and that we certainly find it difficult at that particular time. But I, I, we got a few positive results, like uh, Paul mentioned there. Obviously, we won a couple of times. I think the difficult grounds. I mean, like obviously Stoke, obviously as well as another one that gets mentioned as a tough ground to oh. go to. But we had a lot of positive results there as well, and I believe you scored at Stoke away as well, didn't you? Was it? Was it? I did. You scored. Was it the really, the really good free kick routine where you sort of ran around the back, they tapped it to the side of you, and you, you, you sort of just rifled it straight in. Yeah, I think I might have. Um, but again, Stoke was one of those places you didn't want to play away on a winter's night. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, ha you had to be up for the game. You had to be up for the game, believe me, or you were going to get beaten. Um, <laughs> so yeah, T difficult ground. It was sort of a, it was, it was closed in on, I think mostly and then there was like a big open part where the wind just come howling in and it was wasn't fun like you know <laughs> I, could, I can imagine um unless we've got any more comments then um I, i'm going to ask you obviously about the current whole city team and what your thoughts are and um, like you say you keep up with the results and everything like that and we're we're, we're you know quite a, quite a bit into the season now where you can judge we, we've played enough games where you can say you know how we're doing kind of thing and we're level on points for sixth place. Um, mm -hmm. Rosini, we've got a, we've got a young side, we've got exciting players like Jaden Filigy and Liam Delap. 
I'm um, not sure how much of you keep up with these kind of players. And what do you think, um, realistically, we can achieve as a team this season? Um, do you think playoffs is realistic, or do you think maybe a mid-table and push for it next season kind of jobby? Well, mate, um, I think probably playoffs is is where you're looking. There's a lot of strong sides in the championship, but, but from what I can see, Rosinho seems to be playing a more build-up sort of football. He wants to, he mm. wants to that Pep Guardiola sort of way. Am I right in saying that? Um, yeah, essentially. So I've seen a bit about him, and um, I think probably playoffs would be a really good place for for Hull City. And of course, looking back in years previous, Hull City always do well when they're in the playoffs, <laughs> and maybe you could get promotions. You go to Wembley, but I would love to see the Tigers back in the Premier League again. And I think you've got a very good young squad this year. So who knows? If you, you get automatic promotion, it would be absolutely tremendous. Still early on this season. Yeah, I think the autos might be a little. I mean, Leicester and Ipswich are both. I think um, just running away with it. I mean, I feel the closest to them is obviously Leeds in third, but they've they've both done record breaking starts to the season. It's a bit it's a bit mad the championship. It's really close from like fifth downwards, and they're both in the top four in their own, and the bottom three also are cast away as well. Well, taking Ipswich out of it, who are a tremendous side, but if you look at Leicester, their squad coming out of the Premier League, and you look at Leeds coming out of the Premier League, how are you supposed to challenge these sides when they've got so many resources and so much money at their disposal? Because they've still got those parachute payments coming down, you know? Very strong sides. That's why I'm saying playoffs would be a tremendous achievement. I just think the likes of Leicester and the likes of Leeds, uh, uh, Ipswich are obviously doing well. They're going to be hard to catch this year. Mm, yeah, it's, 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 it's uh, the championship. We have, we say every season, gets harder every year. <laughs> it's just it's just a because, crazy, crazy league. Because um, the, the, the players in the Premier League now are comp- the, the cream from all around the world. So, I mean, the, the championship standards is rising every year as well as players come from all around Europe. You know? Yeah. Uh, do you do? Uh, Paul's asked. Do you think any of uh, your generation of players would have fit into the current uh, Hull City team? Probably the Stuart Greens of this world, um, mm. maybe. But the likes of myself, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I got, I was just get it forward, get it forward as quickly as you can, get get the ball out in the box and scoring goals. But probably I don't think not as much now, you know. But then again, maybe so. Maybe a, maybe a, they call me the goal hanger. Maybe I could have just stayed in the box and waited for the ball to come into the box. And yeah, yeah, the you will need to be involved in the build-up. We'll just let you stay in the box and let everybody else do the passing around and cross it in <laughs> and just finish it off. Yeah, yeah, that would be <laughs> um, you see, We've got a lot of people signing on late, you see. was was, was going to finish, but there's, there's loads of questions. I don't know. If, if you need to get off, just let me know. Um, who did you room with at City? And have you got any funny stories that you, that you can or slash want to, want to wear? Um, I, I room with Andy Dawson. Um, oh. No, no, not many funny stories to be honest with you. With with Andrew Dawson, and um, he was just a relaxed sort of guy, you know. Um, so there was never really, really any uh, funny stories to be such. But Andy liked to get to bed early. I was a late night person, so I like to be on my phone. There's times when he just tell you time to switch that off sure didn't get to, get to get to bed um, but nothing nothing out of the ordinary and he was a sort of regular guy and um, just done our thing you know in the room nothing funny although i've heard some of the stories from like the wind ass and different boys mm. there's some there's some stories over the years <laughs> I, was, I used to room with aaron hughes as well for um northern ireland and again no controversy aaron and i were two very relaxed sort of guys you know we just did our thing and uh yeah there were, there were good days, but Andy Dawson was my roommate. And then, of course, when Peter, or sorry, Adam Pearson, is when we went up through the leagues, we got really swanky because we all got a room to ourselves sometimes. You uh-huh. know? Uh, so we, we, we always, we, we could have got our own room so if, if we had a want of it. That's, a, that's, that's all right then. Um, Paul's, Paul's got a question for both of us. Uh, what do we think of being linked with Ben? Oh, so Ben Brereton Diaz, obviously, I'm um, um, not sure if you're familiar with him, played for Blackburn, um, got Chilean um, nationality uh, after after initially being English and, you know, the whole nationality. If yeah. you've got a grandma that, that lived in somewhere for two weeks, you can probably play for him. Um, but he's, he's obviously left Blackburn, went abroad. Um, there's links that he's coming back. Well, a lot of the UK-based clubs are coming in for him, possibly on loan, something like that. Do you think he'd be a fit for a club like us? Well, to be honest with you, I can't answer it because I don't know much about the guy. Um, That's fair. And if I, if I did, I would be able to give you a better answer, but I wouldn't make something up for the sake of it. <laughs> for me, I mean, I mean, for me, at the minute, we, we seem a bit light in the striker position. And obviously, we've got Liam Delap, who is absolutely fantastic at what he does. He holds the ball and on the spin and defenders, he's an absolute nightmare. And then... 
you've got Aaron Connolly, who's just a completely different kind of striker, who, who, who you know is a bit of a wind up merchant and um, would prefer to get him behind. I mean, I like Colony coming off the bench. I think he's a bit of an impact player. Uh, when when the back four has been tired out by the lap Philogene and whoever's playing on the other side, he he comes on and you know exposes that fatigue and runs in behind. Uh, but he's with injuries. You know, last season massive hindrance to us. Um, this season starting to, to to get a few injuries to key players at, at massive moments of the season where we get a run going, we lose a key player that kind of thing. I do think that in strike we do need another option, um, and obviously he can play enough the left as well. So. I mean, it's one of them. He's got, there's going to be a lot of teams in for, for somebody like Diaz. He, he scored a lot of goals at this level in the championship. So he's going to be in demand. And, and like you say, when you're competing with teams like um, Leicester, uh, Leeds, Southampton, you know, Coventry, who, who, who obviously sold Jocker as a game and they've got a bit of money to play with. Um, so it, so it's has, the, has the owners of, of, of Hull City, have they got a bit of money at their back and, or, or not? He's, 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 I believe he has. Obviously, we've, we've, we've signed on with a lot of um, sponsors, um, you know, current airlines, uh, McVitie's most recently. He's, he's doing very well in terms of the networking and, and, and branching us, making us more global. Um, we, we've got a lot of, um, a lot more money revenue coming in. And, and the last few years, we've kind of survived off um, having really good players and then selling them for a lot of money, uh, like your Jared Bowen, King Lewis Potter, players like that. Um so mm-hmm. I believe that in terms of FFP, we signed like nearly 30 players last season at the beginning. Um, and I can imagine a few of them are on high wages. So I think that we were quite restricted in what we could have done. We spent five million quid on Jaden Philogy in the season. So I, I don't know where we are in terms of what we can spend and what we can't. Um, but yeah. in terms of wages, yeah. I just feel like... Com- when you're competing with some of these teams that have come down from the Premier, it would be tough. But yeah. like you say, that, I mean, we convinced Jaden to come, so why could yeah. we convince somebody else? I think, it, it, especially if you start to get injuries, January will tell a story at how you strengthen the squads and stuff like that. But again, trying to keep up with the likes of Leicester and Leeds with the money that they have is going to be very difficult for people. Mm. Um, Notions asked, uh, what was your favourite goal that you've witnessed while you were on the pitch? So possibly not one that you scored. If somebody else has scored a goal that you know, like Damien Delaney against Bristol, where he just bombarded from centre half and, and ran the length of the pitch and scored. Yeah, um, I was going to say that goal. I can remember it. Everyone was going to him. He'd be getting a nosebleed. He came that far forward. <laughs> what are you? What are you? What are you doing up here, Damien? You know, I've never seen this happen before. He thought it was Lionel Messi. He was taking people on. <laughs> you know, I think he drew it back and then stuck it in the top corner, didn't yeah, he? Thank you. Like, like, and uh, yeah, that was that was probably one that sticks out. The other one um, would be uh, Ian Ashby's one that sealed promotion for us in the first promotion win season at Yeovil. But like Ian Ashby just wasn't known for goal scoring. You know, he was a sitting midfielder, but he, he curled that one from the edge of the box into the, the Yeovil goal. Corner. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was right. So but they're they're two that stick out to me as goals you wouldn't usually see from players who would usually score goals, but were tremendous goals at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, Delaney's best goal was against Rochdale, 30 yards. Yeah, I remember that one as well. I feel like players that don't score very often tend to absolutely, the, the ones that they do score, they, they tend, to, <laughs> tend to be um, absolute Where worldies because, uh, you know, nine you know, times out of 10, they sell 40 yards over the bar. <laughs> yeah. Here, one of my one of my favourite goals as well, I think I scored that day that Damien scored. Do you remember? I was that I was the day we, we again lifted the trophy for promotion as far as I know. But um I scored from about thirty yards, a real bolt of a goal, um, from outside the box, just sort of rifled it right into the centre of the net. And um, so yeah, just a wee memory there as well. Yeah, I, I feel like we asked this earlier, but I think Paul might not have been watching. So what so what do you feel was your best goal? Just for um, yeah, the best goal was Doncaster at home, top of the table clash. Um, feeling wise, it was just tremendous. One on one with the keeper um, after beating the defender, had no energy left. Heard all the seats rising <laughs> as the people got on their feet, and then to um, to slip it away. It was a, an amazing feeling. I was exhausted. I think John Walters he lifted me off the ground, and it was as well he did because it was going to fall just behind the goal line and I, I, I just had nothing left but it was one final push and to win it right at the end was yeah. it was euphoria for everybody so that's the one that made me felt feel and um, the best yeah. you know is it is it is it worse then because i feel like this question gets asked especially by pundits a lot when a striker's or a winger in, in your case is through on goal and you've got a lot of time between mm-hmm. obviously 
getting one on one with a keeper and then shooting. Is it actually worse to have more time to think about it and, and better to have just those instinctive one touch finishes? Do you prefer obviously to just be on the end of one of those rather than be through on goal and having to, you know, sort yeah. of guess yourself? So it all depends what's what your makeup's all about. And there's boys who love more time. Um, mm. and it gives them time to think about where they're going to do things. Um, I, I didn't mind either way because there was times when I was going through on goal. For, like, I can remember against Tranmere, I beat that last defender. I think it was the second goal. I was through in on goal and I had time to think about where I was going to put it and I put it in the top corner. But I was already making up my mind as I was running through on goal what I was going to do. Mm. So I didn't mind that. But it's, at the same time, I was also instinctive. So I like that as well. Just like, boom, you know, I'll just do something out of the blue, i.e. the Brentford goal. Okay, I've just shrugged the guy off and I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do with the ball now? And then a, a split second, no, you're going to shoot. What, from 35, mm -hmm. 40 yards? Yeah. And so that was just instinctive. So I didn't mind either way. Some boys would say they don't like too much time to think about things. Um, I'm thinking... Darwin Nunez at the minute, he's driving me crazy for Liverpool because he's <laughs> he's scoring worldies and he's he's missing a goal from two yards. Yeah, yeah. So he is just driving me, driving me crazy. I suppose it's similar to like when you're taking a penalty because they always say, though, the you, you pick a spot and, and then you stick with it because if you change your mind, um, you start double guessing and, and and then you don't even know where you're going to shoot yourself when you hit the ball. And yeah. I, 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 like you say, well, I, I imagine if you're a natural born goal scorer, it doesn't matter if you've got time or you haven't, because you're already you've already made that decision, like you say, before you, you come yeah. to actually shooting. So but like yeah. I mean you mentioned it yourself, it, it probably depends on what kind of player you are and your makeup is as as, as terms of handling there's pressure a, as well. That's it, mate. There's a, there's a whole array of different players you make up in different ways. Another good goal that I forgot about, by the way, and was um I think it was my last goal for Hull City was against Wigan away. Again, mm. it was another yeah, yeah I know exactly which one you And I just literally I almost flicked it from like 25 yards out and yeah. just landed it over the keeper. So, but that was one again that I just come, come up with in a, in a split second. Yeah, well, so it can happen up, in all yeah. different Yeah. Huddersfield, Huddersfield at home on New Year's Day when I got my cheekbone busted, I came in from the angle and people were expecting me to square it, but the, it skidded through the keeper's legs. That was another... <laughs> Nice goal. I'm just thinking back now, all these different goals. <laughs> you'll have to, you I'll have to get Nathaniel to make you up a, a compilation. We've got someone on the podcast who makes goal compilations. I don't know if he's watching, and he, he can drop a comment. Well, in. But I'll get him to well, make here, a compilation of all of your goals. I believe. Yeah. Well, here's if, if you go on to YouTube, you can actually get Stuart Elliott's. It's a ten minute thing. So somebody called Boothbury Legend or something. Oh. Um, has put, has put a video together, and it's actually really, really good. So, um. I don't watch myself every night, but maybe once a year I'll go on to try and make myself feel better. <laughs> Spend 10 minutes watching all of your goals. Why not? 10 minutes, I mean, the yeah. fact that the video is 10 minutes long just to get all your goals in is a compliment in itself. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, a couple of extra questions then just before we finish then. Um, so you've been in some big games, but what is the best game that you remember being in? So that I, I imagine that would probably be the best <laughs> atmosphere, anything like that. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been in some big games and been in some big stadiums. Um, yeah, I would say the greatest game. I'm sorry for bringing this up, guys, but it has to be brought up. Um, <laughs> was beating was beating England one 0 I had a feeling you were going to say that. One. Windsor Park. I mean, you had Lampard, uh, Beckham, Gerrard, Rooney, Owen, Ferdinand, Terry. I mean, it was the cream of the crop that night, and uh, it was the pinnacle of my football career play from a country against England at Windsor Park. The atmosphere was absolutely outstanding. And then, of course, David Haney scored that famous goal. And um, my face was on the programme that night, so it'll be a collector's <laughs> item for years to come. Uh, but that was that, that was the pinnacle for me. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, it was a great way to, to um, sort of remember my career by beating England that night. Yeah, Of no, course, they, they, beat, they beat us 4-0 at Old Trafford before that. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we'll let you off for mentioning it now that you brought that one up. Uh, <laughs> Notions asked, was you in the same Northern Irish team as Grant McCann? I was. Grant was a good lad. Um, he was a, a, a lad who came in the similar sort of area in Belfast as me. And uh, I had a lot of time for Grant. He had a great left foot as well. And um, Grant actually played in my position. So we were we were fighting for the same position. Right. And... Uh, he scored some cracking goals throughout his career. Um, but yeah, I did. I played in the same team as him. 
and uh, he was a good lad. He's a good manager. Obviously, yeah, I mean, obviously, it, it managed us obviously for a few years. Um, yeah. got us our first title in over fifty years. I think it was obviously when we won the league one yeah. season a few years ago. Um, so yeah, it was a, a, that was something I didn't even realise that he was in the same team as, as McCann. Um, Chris has asked. Uh, oh well, he's, he said, "I always thought the the goal at home to Luton from from the from the byline was was yeah. best." Well, that, See, look, yeah, the, everyone's coming up with different goals. The question, now. the question I often ask is, "Did I mean that goal?" Did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> at least you're honest. No. It was a cross. <laughs> that year, that year, everything was going in for me, but because I was going down the wing and. Uh, and I, I've literally tried to cross it. I was just instinctive, but it, it ends up going over the keeper's head and the back of the net. And like I started to celebrate it. And I think, who was the guy who was playing left back that day? Roland something, something Roland. Roland um, Edge. I Roland Edge. He came up and sort of way pushed me away and says, You didn't mean that. Stop, <laughs> stop, stop celebrating that goal. I said, You celebrate every goal, don't you? Yeah, yeah. If you mean them or not, they, they all count, don't they? They all count the same. Yeah, I um, remember that. Goal. Ben Burgess was injured versus Huddersfield in the nil-nil of the year before they missed the Oval game. I feel that might have been reference to something we were talking about earlier. I mean, yeah. Ben Burgess missed a, a large... Was, was it a whole season with injury, I think, Burgess he missed? Did. He did. Yeah. Was it a knee, knee injury he had? Was it, was it knee? Yeah, yeah, it was a bad one. Big Ben was a great player too. Great at holding the ball up. You know, always... His touch was tremendous. Um, and he was a great lad again. I was also good friends with Danny Alsop. Um, Danny lived around the corner from me in Bruff. And uh, yeah, we made very good friendship. Um, him and his him and his wife, Vanessa, with my wife, Laura. Um, great days. Danny was a good striker. But him and Ben worked really well together because Ben was yeah. right, hold it up, flick it on. Danny was that one who liked to run in behind. Um, and finish. So yeah, good good memories. Yeah, it was like that, that classic little and large partnership. I feel like Danny Olsoff would have been one of those players from the question earlier. That I feel like in this team would do very well as well. He was a, he was a natural finisher. One of Olsoff. He was. I always he feel was, like when I look back, at, uh, he he should have stayed with us for so much longer. He was such a yeah, good player. Yeah, he should. I think to be honest with you, and um, Danny was uh, he loved his home as well. He loved, yeah, yeah. He was a little, little bit homesick, you know. Um, and I spoke to him a few times about that, and he would say, you know, oh, you know, would love to get back to to stress Australia. I think he grew up so. Um, I think it, it wasn't easy for him living halfway across the world as well. Yeah, very tough. I mean, I, I I do believe that that was sort of explained when he left, that he was obviously wanting to return home. And fans obviously yeah. won't begrudge him at that. But it, it's a shame, no, no. obviously, from a selfish perspective, that, you know, such a, a, a quality player left um, sort of premature from uh, fans' perspective. He was, was a good-looking guy as well. He maybe wanted to go back and do a bit of surfing. On the <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Paul's got another question. Uh, would you rather play in a big game like the Doncaster one for the title, which would have had amazing an, atmos uh, an amazing atmosphere, or would you rather go down to Stoke or Luton on a Wednesday night in December, like you said, and have to be up for the game, or you go into hospital or, or losing the game? <laughs> so, would you prefer to be in a big game? Like so, Doncaster would you prefer to be in like a big sort of high stakes game like the Doncaster one, or would you rather be? You know, a game where you've got to really get yourself sort of agged, for, agged up for it, like a Luton or a Stoke away, where you know if you win, it's going to be, you know, worth. I mean, both of them. Are, are, are... Both of the, both of them are rewarding. Um, of course, when you win away on a Tuesday night, uh, when it's the the elements are against you, to w go away with three points and come back down the motorway again, um, is a really wonderful feeling. But to get ready for big games and to deliver on those big days. No greater feeling than that. Mm. Here, I, I can remember another big game. I think it was the first promotion winning season. I actually had the flu and I was in my bed at like three o'clock that day. It was a remember the Swansea game. Um, there was like 25,000 there that night. And I actually had the flu. And I got out of bed with the, the flu and came, played the game, scored a header that night. And literally, I shouldn't even been on the pitch. I was not well at all. But <laughs> It was, a, it was a massive game. And I can remember there was actually 2,000 Hull City supporters who couldn't get in that night. The place was absolutely jam-packed. And they mm. get out of my bed, have the flu, come and score. The, the, I think we, we won 1-0, one scored a header from a corner, and then uh, get back home and get in the bed again. <laughs> it was a good, good feeling. Good days of work. Did, did, so did you not tell the manager you was ill then? Did, did, he, did you play? He knew. 
he knew. He knew. He he asked me to get out of bed and come. Oh, right. He actually said, "He said this is a massive game. This is a massive game. So can you do it?" And I said, "Yeah, I can do it." So I got ready that night and uh, and uh, yeah, did the business, and then we can we can uh, get back home, back in the bed again. <laughs> Uh, and I feel like maybe the last one because we've been, we, we, we've kept you for an hour, nearly an hour and a half, Stuart. Yeah, an that's half. fine. I told him. I, told I don't. Him I don't mind. About half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, you get you get extra for you get extra for that, Stuart. Uh, um, so, uh, how, well how well do you remember your City debut? Oh, I remember it well. That's a great one. That's a great one. Um, who, who was it again? Uh, South End was it South End? Yeah, yeah I think it was. Park? Yeah, we were having an absolute stinker of a day. And the pitch was dry, the pressure was on, all of these new signings. I think we went 1-0 down, and then I scored my first goal on my debut. And, like, Boothbury Park went absolutely crazy that day. Um, but, yeah, I'll never forget that. I think it might have been 2-2 or 2-1. I can't remember. But the Stuart, Stuart Green scored as well, as far as I know. But... Great, and then the supporters took to me right from the first day. Um, so that was a, I'll never forget my debut. Yeah, I Jan suppose Moldy scoring on your debut is always, always a good way to endear yourself to the fans, isn't it? <laughs> it is. But Jan Moby was my hero, by the way. Um, so he was, like, I watched him playing for Liverpool. And he got the sack after a short while, um, but it all worked out for the best. Uh, oh, we'll, we'll stick this one in because I'm actually really interested to know this one, but I feel like you've probably already answered it. Matthew's asked, Boothry Park or MKM Stadium? I mean, because the two amazing stadiums, obviously Boothry mm -hmm. is one of those old styles, but there's so much nostalgia about it. And it's, it's it, yeah. for its time, it was amazing, obviously, with the floodlights and everything like that. And then, but like mm -hmm. you say, the MKM Stadium was just, you know, for, for at the time, at the level of football we were at as well, was just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Boothry Park, yes. Uh, the, especially those old grounds, I love playing at them. I love the way the net seemed where, you know, the netting, the way it just fell. And then the pitch had this, like, a slope on it, it's just the old style of pitches. But the groundsman done a tremendous job on the pitch, I remember. he It was always a great pitch. But I'll be honest with you, coming into the MKM Stadium was just something else. You know, the, the warm-up areas next to the changing room, everything was high-tech. We were so much more advanced than the other sides in the league. And... Uh, Going out onto that pitch was just amazing, and the space that you had for me as a winger, it was a, it was just a dream to play in every every single week. And uh, yeah, I loved that. I absolutely loved that stadium, especially in front of the West Stand, you know, or the <laughs> East Stand, I should say, where all the yeah, yeah. All the, I mean, it's it's, it's different now because obviously the the away fans are put kind of in the in the northeast corner, so they have the corner of the right. this, instead of the behind the goal, um, okay. so that the the atmosphere, the atmospheric part of this east stand sort of split and was put into the north stand so you kind of get it okay. from both now it's it's a oh, bit different to what it was but well, yeah it's it, no there were good days though and um yeah definitely the mkm that was a tremendous stadium to play in i mean we we, we were fortunate weren't we that some facilities they're absolutely brilliant facilities yeah i remember i remember the open day i remember being taken by my uncle down to um walk around the stadium because obviously as a kid um when i used to go to city obviously it was boothry park and um going to the the, the the what it was the KC at the time um was mm. just walking around it and seeing the size of it and walking around the pitch and just thinking god this is our stadium like it just it didn't feel it didn't feel real um but, yeah it really was for, especially like we say for the for the level of football as well i mean being in the bottom division for you know nearly 20 years and then pulling out yeah. that stadium it was it was yeah. so much well, and it built, it built momentum as well. If you can think, you know, we're getting 12,000 or whatever it was at Boothbury Park and then going from that to 23, 24,000 people. I mean, everyone, family, people were bringing their children to the games. It was just so family oriented and it really built a lot of momentum in the city, you know, the focal point. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting as well because I feel like, especially nowadays, when, when you look at teams that move from sort of their iconic stadium into something more modern and new, they actually struggle. Um, yeah. you know, results wise at home, that they, they actually yeah. they, they struggle for quite a while. Whereas I feel like we didn't have that. The KC, it kind of it just it we, we carried on, it, it didn't halt us whatsoever. We just kicked on from what we'd, we'd started at Boothry, and it, it didn't really affect us at all. Yeah. If anything, it enhanced it, like you say. It was it's, it's kind of an anomaly in that. I think, like, if you think the most recent I can think of is obviously Arsenal from Highbury to Emirates, and 
and West Ham from Upton Park to the Olympic Stadium. They they, they did struggle at the new stadiums for a bit, but we, we didn't. We just, we we just took it like a duck to water, and it seemed to click. And with the talent we had in the team, it suited us, you know, because we could play proper football, and uh, all our strengths really came to the fore. Right. Uh, so yeah, I feel like I'll let you get off now, Stuart, because <laughs> we've right. we've had you for a lot longer than probably what. We've had a good chat before. anyway. Um, yeah, it has been. Know, yeah, I, I mean, a lot a lot of people have loved having you on. Like you say, cheer lads, great chat. Good luck, Stuart, in what you're doing. Absolutely. I mean, like like we say, you're you you were a fantastic player for us, and you're a fantastic person. And yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like every City fan, um, if they could, would just be saying thank you a million times for what you did as a whole City player. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I mean, do you know? Do you know what? I just want to want to publicly say thank you to the fans as well, um, because they were tremendous to me, my wife, and my children. Um, even living in the wee village of Bruff, you know, everywhere we went, people were so welcome, and I can't speak highly enough of, of the people of East Yorkshire. So, um, thankful for my time there. Great to chat with you tonight, mate, and um, I hope the team go on and do really well this year. Yeah, cheers for coming on. Uh, like I say, it's been an absolute honour. Um, I think I feel like I reached out to you before, and I, I got so busy that we didn't get you on. It's, it's been it's been great yeah. to have you on. I've yeah, wanted see, to get. See, see, to be honest with you, Aunt, see when I think about technology, I freak right out. I am not <laughs> a tech. See, see if I didn't have Google or YouTube, I would be stuck. My kids are brilliant, but like even getting onto this link, I know you might think, well, it's pretty easy, but. My wife had to set this stuff for me. I'm a nightmare. <laughs> so. It's all right. I mean, it went better than the Phil Brown one did. I don't know if you've ever watched the the chat we had with Phil Brown. Um, no. He he wanted to do it on his tablet, so we right. set it up on he set it up on his tablet, but the sound didn't work. So he, he was right. he was on he was on the video, but we couldn't hear a word he was saying. So then he set yeah. it up on his phone. But he said that his volume on his phone wasn't brilliant. So we spent 90% of the video looking into Phil Brown's earlobe because he had to keep getting oh. up to his phone to hear her speak. So it's well, gone better than that. Yeah, yeah. I think thankfully um, I haven't had those problems tonight. But, you know, I just freak out. Like I, I said I say to my wife, well, well, what do we do now? <laughs> She's like, oh, well, you have to download this. I said, what does it mean to download? <laughs> it's just it's so stupid. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, Actually, tomorrow, um, I don't know if you've seen, we're at the Football Content Awards at Anfield in Liverpool. Uh, we won bronze for Best CFL Podcast last season. We are actually there at the final again this year. Um, it is tomorrow. Uh, Tigers Newsroom are there for the first time. Uh, they're absolutely amazing. Yeah. Check them out as well. Um, so, yeah, we'll see you, Sam, and, and, and Marcus, and everybody that's going with them. Um, thank you, Stuart, for coming on. Thank you, everybody that's tuned on today. Obviously, this was the Tall and Back Podcast. We are sponsored by uh, Old, Zool Old Zoological Bar on Pearson's Avenue and kingfisher fish and chips um massive shout out to the wife <laughs> for paul there we'll let that get that in <laughs> chris, 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 for fish and chips now just mentioned that, so. <laughs> chris has called you a legend i mean fairly 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 accurate description i would say you fall into legendary status for all for me um and yeah like i say thank you for coming on thank you everybody for tuning Thanks. in uh, and and we will see you hopefully as award winners along with tiger's newsroom for the next episode on on um I, think we're doing one on sunday don't quote me on it we'll 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 we'll, we'll get back to you all on that one um but yeah thank you for tuning in everybody cheers Stuart, and we'll see you again next time thanks Paul.